So our goal today is to get through the high-low game, which, if I'm not mistaken, the only thing that we had to do with the high-low game was look at how the dice was displayed. I think we pretty much covered it. We'll probably rewind now and review the stuff in it, just to make sure we know what we're talking about. I mean, we haven't been doing this for that long, right? So we'll do the high-low game. Then we will look at Deedle's tip calculator, which uh, is more involved and illustrates a few different points than what have been illustrated previously. So, remember, the drill in lab is to, if you have finished something, upload it to Canvas, bring it up on your machine, and call me over. Okay, so. To refresh our memory on the high-low game. We we'll spend most of our time looking at the Java code. We'll spend a minute looking at the layout. The layout, if you recall, there are two images. We have a content description, a layout width, and IDs associated with it. They're both image views. Notice the one thing that we don't have with the image view is the actual image name that gets displayed in it. Because we haven't played the game yet. Before the game starts, before your first chance to, first round of playing the game, uh, we don't want anything to appear in that image. So if we go and run this, there's the two images. All right. So now those views get the uh, get that, and apparently the simulator is a little too small to see the balance goes sort of down below. Maybe we can play with that and and get that to to do what we what we want to. Okay. So let's look at the Java code. Hit the high points of that. Notice we have two classes here. We have a class for the dice because the thought is, is that something we could possibly use elsewhere in an application? If you imagine if we had uh, a bigger application that had several dice games in it, we would want the behavior of the dice to be the same in all of them. We wouldn't, have to, we wouldn't want to reinvent that in every application. So I've created a dice object that we could use. The main activity is an app compatibility view. All right. It implements on ClickListener, which means that it has the code in it to handle the on-click event of the button. We can say that because we have an on-click method here. All right. That on-click method is a method that is in the onClickListener interface. So in order for a class to implement that interface, it needs the onClick method in it. All right. What does that do? We go, we take our bat, we roll the dice. We call the dice object's roll function. We'll look at that in a minute. But essentially what that does is it rolls the dice and it gives us a value of 1 through 6. We do that for both dices and then we total it up. Then we point to the two images.
we add it up, do the calculation, see if they won or not. And I think the most, the place that we didn't really talk about is we set dice one and dice two are the two image views. We set their image resource to very long string. Set image resource, get resources that point somewhere to this folder. All right? Resources related to that folder. What resource do we want? I want the name of the image that I'm getting from the dice object. We'll look at that dice object in a minute, but just know that just like giving us the value, that dice object contains the name of the image. What are the names of the images? They are D1 JPEG through D6 JPEG. So if I rolled a 1, then this function is going to return a 1. And when I ask for the image, it's going to give me D1.JPEG. All right. What type of image is it? It is a drawable. It lives in the drawable folder. And I can't see the rest of it, but I think it says get package name. It's the image that relates to, it's, it's in the resources relating to this package. So this grabs the image out of that drawables folder and sets the first image view and the second image view equal to that image. So after we've rolled the dice, we get the image, uh, image of the dice to appear. Let's look at the dice object. The dice object, pub, public class dice, is part of this package. It has two properties, a value, which will be one through six, and then it has a random object, and the random object is used to generate a random number. calls the random object and generates a number between 0 and 5. This is a random object. Next int calls that function on the random to give the next random integer. And it gives us a number from 0 to 5. All right up to, but not quite up to, 6. All right, so give us an integer where 6 is, has to be below 6, and it starts at 0. Then we add 1 to it. So what we've done is we have translated, instead of having the number from 0 to 5, we have the number of 1 through 6. And return, we return that value. The other thing we have in this is to get the image name. The image name for the dice is simply D followed by the value of the dice. So it returns D1 if I rolled a 1, D2 if I returned a 2, and so on. And then this instruction takes that image that's part of the resources, that's, part, that's a drawable, whose name is the value that I get from the dice class, and sets this image view's image to, uh, to that image. Can, can I back up a yeah. bit on this? Sure. I don't see a, a type identifier like GIF or PNG or that type of thing. Uh, you apparently don't need it. Okay. Yeah, I was a little surprised at that too, but apparently you don't need it. Uh, I don't know what would happen if you tried to have a D1 JPEG and a D1 PNG in there. I don't know. Maybe you don't have to have it, but you could put it in. I'm not really sure, but that, that's a good observation. All right. Right now it makes it this big, because if we look at these images... a certain size. 
I could in my XML say that I want the layout width to be maybe, let's say 50 dp. We'll talk about what dp is in a little bit. I just want to do this to make it a little bit smaller so that we can see the total on the screen. A lot of, in a lot of things, you only need to specify one of the attributes and it like figures out the other one. There's a layout high up out there. Um, and sign the line. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't even notice that layout height was there. Let's try that. Good eyes. And there we go. We can see the balance. Good. All right. We see that the balance gets at uh, incremented or decremented after we play. Any questions about this guy? Nothing earth shattering. All right. I've got a question yeah. again on images. Mm -hmm. In the homework assignment for three, you said to make it specific to screen density. Yes. What does that mean? We'll talk about that. Okay. All right. We'll talk about that uh, going forward because. I did put the density in this one, uh, but the second example I think is a better example of the, the DP. Because the DP is a little confusing. Actually, let's talk about it now. All right. DP stands for Density Independent Pixels. Okay, what does that mean? What that means is Android devices can have a bunch of different screen densities. All right. Let's make the math easy and say we have an image that's 100 pixels by 100 pixels. screen. doesn't matter what size the screen is. 
because we're not talking about the screen size, we're talking about the screen pixel density. What do I mean by pixel density? How many pixels are in a certain area? What are pixels? Each little, each little dot, right, source of light. So in other words, if you look real closely, if you put a magnifying glass up to a monitor or whatever, you'll see if you had a line, let's say I have an image that looks like this. If I put that under a magnifying glass, I would see little dots going like this, if this is magnified, okay? So the pixel density is how many pixels per inch, all right? How many pixels per inch? So, this screen, let's say, this is my image, a smiley face. It's 160 by 160. All right. Let's say this is 160 pixels per inch, or DPI, dots per inch, or pixels per inch. How big would this image be if it was displayed on the screen? It'd be one inch by one inch. So the pixel, the picture would look like this. Let's say that I had a screen that was 320 dpi. All right. How big would that image be on that screen? Half an inch by half an inch. It'd be tiny. It would actually be not half as big as this, it would be a quarter as big as this, right? Because it would be half in two dimensions. Let's flip this around. Let's say I had a pixel that was 80 pixels per inch, a screen that was 80 pixels per inch. How big would the image be? Two inches. Two inches. So it would be big. sharp as this, but it would be bigger. That's not really a good thing, right? Ideally, we would want images to be the same size regardless how, how dense the screen was in pixels. All right? Regardless how dense the screen was in pixels. So, instead of, so when we give a size to something, we don't give a size in pixels. We give a size in DPs or DIPs. That stands for density independent pixels. And what it will do is it will adjust the size of the image on the screen to make it, how do I want to say this, to make it, um, approximately the same size regardless of how dense the screen is. So, let's say, it's this, here's this, the, this image that's out there, and there's 160 pixels by 160 pixels. Let's say, I make this image ADDP in my Android layout file. Okay. Let's go through the calculation of how big it will be. 160 is like the benchmark. All right, that's like a medium density screen. All right. 
I, I probably should in a minute here Google this just to make sure things haven't changed in a newer version of Android. But typically when I've taught, last time I taught this class, 160 was considered medium density. So for a 160 DPI machine, an 80 DP pixel, an 80 DP image would be 80 pixels. So for medium density, the DP is the same as pixels. Because that's sort of the benchmark. Now, for a greater density, you take the ratio of the density to 160 and multiply it by the DP, and that's how many pixels it will be. So, at this wide density, I'll take the 80 DP multiplied by 320 over 160, and it will be 160 pixels on this machine. Same thing for a less dense device. 80 pixels, I'll take the ratio of 80 to 160 and multiply that by 80 dp. That'll give me 40 pixels. Now, What can we observe about this? How big physically is a 40 pixel image on an 80 pixel per inch screen? Yeah. Half an inch. How big is an 80 pixel image on a 160 pixel per inch? Half. How big is a 160 pixel image on a 320 half. So, by expressing the pixels, or I'm sorry, by expressing the size of images in DPs instead of pixels, the density of the screen is taken into account. And the actual physical size of the image against displayed will get adjusted. More pixels will be displayed on a denser device. Less pixels will be displayed on a less dense de device. And the bottom line is they should be all approximately the same size. All right? And, of course, the denser, uh, the, denser the machine is, or the, the screen is, the sharper and better it's going to look. All right? But they'll all physically be the same size. So you don't have to worry about the image taking up the whole screen, in this case, and be in a little bitty postage stamp on this screen. All right? Makes sense? Okay, let's look. Let's make sure that I have my numbers right and nothing has changed since the last time I taught this. Class.
here are some difference densities. 80 was not a very good number. I just pulled 80 out of my hat. As it turns out, the screens don't get that undense. Low density would be negative 120 dpi. Medium would be 160. And as it says, and as I said, that's the baseline. HDPI would be 240. XHDPI would be 320. And then again, screens are getting even more and more dense. There is an XXX HDPI, which would be 640 pixels per inch. Not what size, what screen density. What screen density, Right. Because the size of the screen is a different issue. All right, it's independent of this. I could have a tiny screen, physically a tiny screen, that's very dense. Or I could have a gigantic screen that isn't dense at all. So that would come into play as well. All right. Now, the other thing that they suggest doing and let me look here, is you can actually have resource qualifiers. You can give, for example, an image. You could give several versions of the image and put the resource qualifiers on it for medium density, high density, extra high density, extra, extra high density, extra, extra, extra high density. I don't think we did that in this example. Let me look. Now, my drawables aren't like that. Are my icons? Yeah. There's actually five icons for this application. So when, like, I install it on this machine, there's the icon it gets. It will install it with the proper icon depending for then depending on, rather, the screen density. All right? This is another example of a what. What did I call this when we were dealing with languages? When I dealt with languages, I said, well, we could have an English strings file, we could have a French strings file or a Spanish strings file. And we put, like, something on the end to indicate that Spanish was qualifier, right. Qualifier. It's called a resource qualifier. In other words, this says, under what conditions do you use this resource instead of the default? If we look out on disk here, we can actually see that for the icon, there's actually folders with .hdpi, .mdpi, .x. So the resource qualifier is actually on the folder, all right, and not on the file name. So does it auto-generate one for each one? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Now, if you were going to do this, I mean, I could have done a better job on this by making these be qualified. All right, and had a, uh, a dice for low density, a dice for high density, a dice for medium density, and so on. But I didn't do that. So this is the second case of what we saw as resource qualifiers, whereas we tell Android, here, we have something that we're using, and pick which one of them you're going to use depending on the environment. use depending on the screen density. In the case of our strings file, pick which strings XML file to use depending on the language of the device. Other questions about this one? All right. Let's go and open up Deedle's tip calculator. And then we'll take a 
a look at it. For most of the examples that we're going to cover from here on in, our main interest is going to be in two places. It's going to be on the Java code and it's going to be in the layout XML. The strings file and the styles file, we've gone over them and they're not particularly interesting. All right? I mean, I think you kind of get the idea. In this case, here's the strings file to contain those different strings. We actually have a dimensions XML file that has a resource qualifier of screen width. And we can go out and see the actual physical files out on disk for those. Somewhere. I know you can't see it, but all right, values and values dash W A two O D P. So that's the width of it. There's a different set of dimensions. So again, the resource qualifier is on the folder. I didn't notice how it did it before with languages, if it put it on the folder or if it put it on the file. Probably created a folder for it. One thing that we probably won't do, but you can, and it's worth it introducing, is you could actually have a combination of resource qualifiers. So you could have W, a width of 820 DP Spanish and a width of 820 DP French. So you could do things differently, even for wide for wide devices, even if it's Engli uh, uh, French, English, or Spanish. So you could combine them. And again, you see here the dimensions. There isn't a strings file for that. There isn't a styles file, but there's a dimensions file for that. And essentially, well, how would you expect these files to look? What do you think the 821 is going to look like compared to the regular XML file? 820 would be a fairly wide screen. How do you think that's going to compare to the dimensions in the regular XML file? Pardon me? It's not going to be as wide. Which one's not going to be as wide? The regular one. The regular one. So the regular one, we say, for example, the margin is 16 dp. Here we say the margin is 64 dp. That's actually the only one that we change. All right? I'm actually surprised at that. But essentially, they gave a bigger margin if it's on a bigger screen. That's really the only difference. At any rate, we're going to spend most of our time not looking at these values. We'll talk about them from time to time. We'll definitely talk about resource qualifiers more from time to time. But most of our looking is going to be at this uh, layout XML and the Java that goes with it. That's where most of the action is. Let's look at the layout file. Layout file. Remember, a layout file typically has a layout. And we've seen a couple of different layouts before. We've seen a... What kind of layout? I, 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 love, I love not being able to remember stuff because then I can make it look like I could buy myself some time and ask it as a question. Like, oh, of course I know the name of the layout, but do you people know? What kind of layout have we seen so far? Linear. Linear layout. Right. Absolutely. You are correct. See, I'm glad someone was paying attention. Uh, a linear layout simply means that things are in a line, either horizontally or vertically. Can you nest linear layout? Absolutely, I think you did it in, in the one. When you nest linear layouts, what you could do is you could have overall the views be stacked horizontally, but one of the or I'm sorry, vertically, but
but one of the views could contain a horizontal layout and have three things side by side by side. So you could actually, it would, it would almost be like having an HTML table, right, where you have rows and columns, the, the, uh, and so on. But you could you can nest these labels, um, I'm sorry, not labels, but layouts to get a more extensive view. This is a grid layout. And what do you suppose a grid layout is? This is actually more like a table than, than mixing those other ones. Because a grid layout is where you have a certain grid of things. You have rows and columns. And when you define a grid layout, you define how many columns that you have. All right? So in this case, we have two columns. All right? So in other words, as we go down, the first view is going to be in the first row, first column. The second view, unless we do something, is going to be in the first row, second column. The third view is going to be in the second row, first column. The fourth view is going to be in the second row, second column, and so on. So as we add elements, as we add views to this layout, It's going to add them like this. First view goes there, second view goes there, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and so on. All right? We did that because we said there's two columns in this grid. And there will be as many rows as we have views to fit that. Except they did a little trickery in this one. This one actually had me thrown for a minute. This actually says that this is in column zero, and the one after it, we specify, is also in column zero for row zero. So both of these get put in row zero, column zero of our grid. What do you think the impact of that's going to be? I would think one would overlay the other. They're going to be overlaid. Exactly. So let me show you how this works. All right. That, this is the only thing we do that for, right? Because the next one, we don't specify anything about it. So it would go in the first row, second column. First row, I lied. Because it said this, these have a call span of two. So they cover the entire first row. First row, first column, first row, second column. This guy is in the second row, first column. This guy is in the second row, second column, and so on down the line. I might have gotten off base there, but you get the idea. Let's run this and take the look, take a look, and we'll see about that overriding business. There's a tip calculator. All right? This is the first row. These two fields are actually two different fields. The enter amount and the blue box are actually two separate fields. And this is the first item, this is the second. This is the second row, first column, second column. Third row, first column, second column. Fourth row, first column, second column. And the way this works is I can go and enter in the amount. I just wanted to enter it in on the emulator. So I could enter in, let's say that I spent $21. Notice how that entry works. It automatically formats it as a dollar, all right, as dollars and cents. So the first two I have, it said two cents. Then when I hit two one, it said 21 cents. Then when I hit another zero, it said $2.10. And then finally I hit the last zero and it says $21. Make the keyboard disappear. All right? 
it calculates the tip and the total. The total simply being the amount plus this plus that. Notice a couple things about this. We're entering in this field. This is actually two fields. Don't believe me? I'm going to play with the layout a little bit. I'm going to get rid of layout row zero and layout column zero. All right? So it's not going to overlay anymore. They'll be stacked on top of each other. And we'll see what that looks like. So I'm in there. Notice that as I type in here, I'm typing into a text enter field. It's formatting nicely in the text field or the text view. So I'm actually typing in the edit text field, but it's automatically formatting the text view. And we'll see how it does that. We don't notice that I'm typing in there because in the actual layout, we put this guy We put this guy right over top the other one. We put it in the same row and in the same column. So as we run this, our entry is typing in the edit text field, but the formatted display is this text view. And that text view is on top of the edit text field. So, neat little trick they did here simply to, um, I don't know, make the screen look cleaner, make the input look cleaner, and so on. How did they get this recognized as being currency? Because it looks like they are just saying numbers zero through nine. Well, we'll, we'll see that yet. Okay. There's nothing in the layout, there's nothing in the layout that makes it currency. All right. Uh, max length of two. I'm sorry, max length of six. Uh, I don't see anything in the layout that implies that this is currency. So therefore, it must be in the code. All right. Other questions? Okay. So we have a grid layout, column count is two, these simply put themselves in rows and columns across and down, except where we have overridden that and said this text field appears on top of this edit text field. This, these two fields also span two columns, so they take up the whole row, both of them, and they're right smack dab on top of each other. Other than that, the layout isn't particularly interesting. Bunch of text views. There's some properties, play around with it, see what they do. What's that elevation do? Elevation of 4DP, what do you suppose that does? But that relates to a little shadow there. Let's make it big. Yeah. So we could we could put a bigger number in there, or we could change the elevation in the strings file. I'm sorry, not the strings file, the dimensions file. And it's going to be floating really high. much higher, much bigger shadow. Now, the one thing that's brand new in this, other than some of these other attributes, 
is the seek bar. All right, which is a slider. Okay. The slider starts off at 15%, goes from 0 to 15. I'm sorry, 0 to 30. And the default when we first open the page is 15%. Okay. We made this maximum 50, then we could give up to a 50% tip if we we're really high rollers. But it always gives us a number from 0 to whatever the max is, and 15 is the default. Indeterminate? I have no idea what that means. I don't know. Change it to true. See what happens. <laughs> All right. Or Google it. All right. Uh, I'm bringing this up just because it's not like I have all these things memorized. All right. The things that you use a lot, you're going to remember. The things you're not going to use a lot, you're not going to remember. All right. Now. The next part that we're going to look at on Thursday relates to listeners. Because if you notice, we do not have a case of a button that you press to do the calculation, like we had on the simple calculator. Things are calculated when, number one, we change the value. As soon as I change the value, it recalculates it. All right. The values also change if I scroll this. So there is not a button with an on-click listener. How many listeners do you suppose that we have? Just think in your head. Raise up the number of fingers you think it is. I was going to say, that's a hint that it's less than five. We actually have two listeners. All right? We have a listener for the enter text field, because when that changes, the calculations occur. And we have a listener on the slider, or the seat bar, actually, that changes when, when we slide that. So this is going to implement the listeners in a different way. All right. I just want to take a last second to look at the activity class. And if we look at it, notice that this does not implement anything. All right. So this class is not going to serve in the role of a listener because it doesn't implement the listener. The other two examples that we had that had listeners implemented the on-click listener. And so the code to handle the clicking of the button was here. This doesn't implement any kind of listener. So we know that the listeners have to be in another class. If you get a chance between now and what day of the week is it? It's Tuesday. So if you get a chance between now and Thursday, Take a look and see if you can figure out how this GUI is wired to the listeners. How does a listener bit happen in this case? Can't be done like we did before where we said blah, 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 dot, set, listener, this. Because this activity isn't any kind of listener. So other classes must be put into play. And next time, we'll see how that happens. And then we'll review this in more detail. Are there any questions? Okay, I'm going to go unlock the door on the lab. And I'll come back here, get my stuff, get my files and all that. And then I'll be back in lab. If you have something for grading, 